I was uh, reading Tozer. You know, Tozer's really a good book to read when you want to get busted. <laughs> I mean, he lived in our generation. He is a little bit before ours, sort of, but he's in our generation in the sense that he knew what the fundamental Christian was like, or the charismatic fundamentalist Christian. You know, the, he saw what we were going through, and he addresses it very bluntly. And I kind of have thought about sometime maybe. Ah, maybe not. <laughs> about writing books, you know, kind of like Tozer's, you know, and maybe taking the time to address some of the things that are could be updated in this 21st generation, like man caves, you know. What part of a man cave is there in it that has God anywhere related to it? I don't think there's anything probably in anybody's man cave that relates to God. And where did we get this idea that dressing sloppy was dressing up? Or that somehow dressing with football jerseys hanging out, you know, and being sloppy or stupid at a football game was being an example of a believer? I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, a lot of typical topics that we could talk about, you know, and say, that's oh, just having fun, that's just taking some time off, blowing off steam, you know. I mean, you work 40 hours a week, 60, 80, whatever, you know, and so you need to blow off steam and have some fun, take Jesus with you. After all, we have Christian football players, baseball players, basketball players, soccer players, swimmers, gymnasts. You know, I'm sure that there were Roman gladiators that were Christians killing each other. I'm sure that there were Roman cohorts that didn't walk out on the ice and die with their soldiers to be a witness for Jesus. I'm sure that those that were standing, the centurion, on the side when he watched those soldiers stripped down to no clothes rather than deny Jesus and he decided to go out and stand with them I'm sure that was just you know zealousness you know he wasn't really a Christian a real Christian would have like hey we need to witness to the world so let's just kind of like you know not risk our life right now and be silent witness you know let our job silently be our witness I'm sure that centurion wasn't remembered or was he Tozer is not a good book to read if you're one of those compromising Christians nowadays as a matter of fact if you're compromising in some way you don't want to hear this devotional right now because <laughs> I'm warning you ahead of time it's going to address your selfishness it will address your idea of your own rights to yourself. After all, you know, I have my time, you know, and God has his time, you know, and I give him tithing, you know, so he's got his time to stay, you know, kind of like over there because I need to fulfill my purpose. Right. Okay. So I laugh at, you know, when I was reading it because, you know, there have been times in my life where, you know, I was a... First of all, I've held a lot of jobs, you know. And because I was disabled so many times in my life from Crohn's disease killing me, you know, nearly dying three times, that, you know, I, I, I had kind of a weird resume anyways, but then I had kind of a strange resume when there were gaps from me nearly dying that couldn't very well put them down, you know? I mean, it's kind of like, what kind of person would hire a handicapped person who's dying from Crohn's disease, you know, and suddenly go, hey, you know what, I think I'll give you a job. <laughs> So, you know, my resume was always very creative, you know. Being a freelance writer, I guess that was some of my gaps, you know. But the point being is that, you know, during those times of my years of suffering, you know, I would have a job for maybe a year, you know, and I would be phenomenal at it. It was great. I would succeed, you know, and I'd make the business money, and I'd get promoted and get raises, you know. And unfortunately, that wasn't what God wanted me to be doing with my life. You know, because I was always trying to get into being normal when God made me, dare I say, abnormal? Well, <laughs> okay, maybe. So, 
most of my life has been resisting maybe the calling of God on my life, which was to be in the ministry. And so I was kind of amused because all the times that I've ever been in my jobs or anywhere else, I've always shared Jesus, you know, and talked to people and, you know, related to them and helped them to discover, you know, God. And then I've always had tape lending libraries and ministries in some way on my other time, you know, that I spent a lot of time with, you know. And I did the same thing most people did, you know, in relationships, screwed them up. <laughs> Tried to live, you know, like perfect little lives and when God destroyed them or allowed them to fall apart because of my own sinfulness, of course, I learned from them. And I saw, wow, you know what? You should really sit down and talk to God about what your choices are and your decision making. Then you don't go through these consequences. Oh, so you reap what you sow. Okay, so maybe it takes you 10 years to learn that. Or five, or two, or one, whichever it was for you. You know, for me it was kind of, uh, you know, different things I learned in different ways. And in learning those things, I always thought God was in control anyways. So I never really had a problem with how I learned them. So much as I discovered that God wanted me to spend all my time with Him. Now, I'm like you, you know, I'd love to be a couch potato, and I'm getting ready to give that up again. You see, in my past, I've given up television because I just didn't see much profit in it, you know? I mean, there were times where, yeah, I got into football, and I hate baseball, football, I hate baseball. Did I say I hate baseball? <laughs> Sorry. I know there's somebody out there that's going, I love baseball. You know, they got all the stats and all this stuff, you know, and I don't do fantasy anything, you know. Personally, I don't understand it. You know, I don't seem to have that many friends because they all seem to want to get into their man caves and their, you know, extracurricular activities when I kind of want to go, like, go to a mission field, you know, or go do something, you know, kind of you know, church-related, you know, I want to go build a church someplace, you know. Matter of fact, I think that was what happened just recently. Was that about three years ago, I went to go help a ministry build a church, you know. You know, and that was kind of neat. But my wife and I were sitting around talking about that, and it's been, oh, I don't know, about five years, you know, and I remember that when I was working as a boilermaker, you know, I used to go on these jobs, you know, and you'd go on them for, oh, I don't know, sometimes a month, you know, it'd be a 30, I remember one 30-day job, and it was 12 hours a day. This one job was actually seven days a week, come think of it. I think it was 30 straight. Nah, it could have been 30 straight. It didn't sound right anyways. But it was, you know, 10 days straight or 20 days straight, you know. And we'd work 12-hour days, you know. Make lots of money because, you know, your first eight hours, you know, that's straight time. But man, after that first 40 hours and after that first eight hours, holy cow, were you racking in the dough. <laughs> and so I made phenomenal amount of money in a short period of time and used to drive my wife nuts, you know. And, even then, you know, I was writing my book, my first book, you know, in my Christian fiction series. And, um, you know, I kind of passed one of those out. And it was a pretty, pretty rough book. The first time, the first draft was pretty rough that I published. And even now I kind of cringe a little bit at it, you know, having read it, you know, the original one. And uh, I think about how all of my life has been wanting to, you know, be in ministry. And then one day I just said to my wife, you know, Lori, and I said, you know, honey, I could spend the rest of my life doing everything else, you know, and I have. I said, I've done everything I've ever wanted to do. I've gone to Jerusalem, I've gone to Israel, I've gone here, I've gone to Alaska, I've lived here, lived there, done this job, done that job. So you know what I really want to do? I just want to do the ministry, you know, and so, tell you what, let's just do the ministry. Let's see how this works. And sure enough, when the economy crunch came along and everything was happening and falling apart and stuff, you know, bingo. I went, man, everybody else now is discovering what I discovered, you know? <laughs> so, I think you need to sit down and have a talk with God. If God has put a calling on your life that He wants you in ministry and He wants you to do something other than your 9 to 5 safe little world where you created this typical American dream that you have your washer and your dryer and your, you know, man cave and your four or five cars, two cars, whatever, and your 
reinvesting into another rental unit now and you're building up your little panel houses like the children of Israel did. You're getting secure one more time because the economy is beginning to come back. Let me give you something that Keith Green said to us one time in the Jesus Movement. He said, this generation of souls is responsible for the generation that it's born unto for salvation. In other words, if a person in your generation doesn't know Jesus, that's your responsibility. So what are you doing about your generation for salvation? Because I can look around and say, I think, I think we're looking at a new generation that really has fallen far away from knowing anything about God, much less about Jesus. So where are the third and fourth generations from the Jesus Movement that we should have raised up our children in the godly way that we were supposed to? Or have we forgotten what we were called to do because we picked up our Harleys? We now have all the music we ever wanted from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. We have done our own thing. We have gone our own way. We've become yuppies. What happened to Jesus along the way? Where is your relationship with God today? Are you more involved in God's ministry for you? Or have you become less caring about the generation you're a part of and the responsibility we had as the last generation knowing that Jesus is coming to declare to the world that the end of the world is at hand? What are you doing today to let someone know with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that God is real and alive? Have you taken stock of your life and are you willing to stand before God today and say, Lord, look at my life. I'm such a success for the ministry. Oh, really? You were such a great missionary. No. Oh, you were such a great pastor. Well, no. You were such a great elder. Well, no. You were such a great deacon. No, no. You were such a great... Well, what did you do? Well, you see, I was a... I was a... I was a pipe layer, and you know, I was one of the best pipe layers there was. Matter of fact, I had a high score on Warcraft, you know, I was one of the great Warcraft winners, you know, I got, I even hit the highest of my own, my own server. Really? Okay. Well, that's good. And Jesus will say, I'm proud of you. I'm glad you did that. Now, did you do what I said? Did you... Love your wife? Did you love your children? Did you raise them up in godliness? Did you love the people around you? Did you care about them? Did you reach out and touch people? Did you hear the cries of the needy? Did you minister to them? Did you send them a check? Ah. Did you open your door to those that knocked at your door and said, Welcome, come on in. I want to feed you. I'll clothe you. I'll help you. Did you, did you do any of the things that I said? Really? None? Wow. Do you know me? I don't think I know you. Man's fall created a perpetual moral crisis. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5.19 The fall of man has created a perpetual crisis. It will last until sin has been put down, and Jesus reigns over a redeemed, and restored world. Until that time, the earth remains a disaster area and its inhabitants live in a state of extraordinary emergency. Statesmen and economists talk hopefully of a return to normal conditions, but conditions have not been normal since the woman saw the tree was good for food and pleasant and to be desired to make one wise and took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. It is not enough to say that we live in a state of moral crisis. That's true and obvious, but it, that is not all. For the fall has affected every part of man's nature. Moral, intellectual, psychological, spiritual, and physical. The entire universe has been affected by the fall of mankind. Man's whole being has been deeply injured. The sin in his heart has overflowed into his total life affecting his relationship to God, 
to his fellow man, to everyone and to everything that touches him and to every place that he lives and any place that he goes. It is all affected by his corruption. For he is born in corruption, was conceived in corruption, and will die in corruption. To me it has always been difficult to understand those evangelical Christians who insist upon living in the crisis as if no crisis exists. They say they serve the Lord, but they divide their days so as to leave plenty of time to play and loaf and enjoy the pleasures of the world as well. They are at ease with the world, and as the world burns, they are content to watch it. And then they can furnish many convincing reasons for their conduct, even quoting scriptures if you press them a bit, we occupy until he comes. I wonder whether such Christians actually believe in the fall of man. It's dangerous to read Tozer. It's challenging. Not as hard as Oswald Chambers and my utmost for his highest. But Tozer challenges you in a way that you live in today. Because the reality is, how much time are you on TV? How much time are you on the phone? How much time are you driving to work? How much time is the Lord not with you and the Lord not on your mind? You see, all day long and all the time for the last five years, I have spent probably 12-hour days up until just recently every day in ministry, consistently, cons persistently on the web, on the internet, posting and reposting and pumping out huge amount of material on blogs and internet and setting up networks and getting things ready for what I believe to be the big push from 2013 onward to declare that Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. It could be any day, any day, any day. Because obviously I knew way back when 2012 was going to be a pushover, you know, that people were going to be like up and down and sideways and left and right and all doing their own thing until 2012. And then they would kind of act like it was going to be the end of the world again, you know, like they did at 2000 and they did in 88 and they did farther back. But I kind of knew that ahead of time. Sadly, you know, and so I kind of, you know, maybe did like many of my own contemporaries did. We kind of cruised along. Some of us snoozed along and got into sin and cruised along and got into sin. And some didn't and, you know, built some ministries and they've kind of like got content and they're kind of safe. But I'm asking you. If I could tell you that you will live through 2012 and that from that moment on Jesus could return any day, will you be content to say to yourself, you've done everything you could to tell people about Jesus? You've done everything you should for your family members that you prayed through, you've discipled, you've taught, you've cared for? In other words, is there anything left that you really feel like you haven't done yet. Because what I'm going to say to you is radical to the extreme. Drop what you're doing and do it. If God wants you to be where you're at, fine. But if you've gotten yourself into a rut that you just stay there because you don't know what to do next, you need to stop, get on your knees and pray and ask God to lead the way. Because maybe you might have to, unfortunately for you, walk away from a lot of things to follow Jesus because you didn't follow him before and took up your cross you followed him because it was easy what about now have you ever denied yourself taking up your cross and followed Jesus have you ever given up your home and your life my family to this day says that I'm very much a loner you know I'm I'm like this guy that you know I, I don't seem to you know spend a lot of time with my sisters you know or my brother-in-law or you know some of the people that are like back in Oregon and something you know and they're all like you know settled in their little homes and they got their lives and they do their little things you know and, and I'm content for them and I bless them and I pray for them you know and I leave their messages you know say hey you know what check out what I'm doing in the ministry you know check out what's going on and of course you know being Christians they sort of are interested but not really so you see you may lose something, but you may gain something. You need to sit down 
And this is probably one of the few times, or maybe it's the beginning of times, that God will cause me to share this. But have you sat down and talked to Jesus about what you could do for the kingdom of God? About what your life has come to a focal point, and now you're at a crossroads? What will your life and the sum of your life be when you get done with it? Will you have said, hey, at the end of my life, I ran the race. I finished the course. I have pursued to the end. I didn't lose sight of the mark. I ran to the very end of the race, and I won. Or will you quit, or have you quit before you ever got started? Isn't this the time to kind of like find out what God would have you to do? Isn't this the time now to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying? Maybe you haven't finished what you were supposed to do. Maybe it's time you did what God has called you to do. And maybe God is speaking to you now. I ask you, because of the generation we live in, would you not reach out with your life and touch someone? Maybe it'll be in Africa. Everybody used to say, oh, don't send me to Africa. Maybe it will be. Maybe it'll be like I went to Jerusalem or to Mexico or to Alaska. Maybe it'll be in some foreign land someplace. Maybe it'll be in your own home. But if you're distracted by the world and attracted by all the riches that are coming and all the different things that you want to just kind of like play at, you know, the little tweets, you know, the little the little Facebook here and the tweet there, you know, you, you, know, you got to need a little bit, no, you know, touch base here and touch base there, but you don't really have to get personally involved. Not too personal. Not me, man. Can I ask you at least develop your personal relationship with God even if you don't go into ministry if you don't choose to be a missionary and you don't choose to follow what Jesus said to do which was to go into all nations baptizing in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit and discipling all nations teaching them you know to become likened unto him but also to teaching them to know God in a personal and intimate way even if you don't do those things would you not at least develop yourself put aside your idols Put aside your toys. Put aside your man cave. Put them on the back burner. Focus your attention on Jesus for a moment in time and see if he doesn't have anything yet left to say to you before you come to meet God face to face.